So all nodes must agree. We're going to say that the longest chain fork choice rule is how we do it. Right now, who's going to propose updates to the chain? Well, the miners are also doing this. So they're looking for a hash that's less than a target. And this is a race condition. If they find a hash that's less than a target, then they are entitled to take the reward. So I mean, it's kind of like winning. It's kind of like winning, um, except that the game is, is fair. It's not, um, there's no competitive advantage. You know, uh, if you think about sports, there's an advantage to like spending more money or like training harder or like finding the right players, improving your strategy. There's, there's basically none of that. Bitcoin mining is just, can you find the hash and meet the target? If you can, then you can earn the block reward. So what does this look like? So our block here on the left, what we're going to do is we're going to do a hash. So this is a SHA-256 hash, which we saw last week. The data we're going to hash, we're going to take the previous block. We're going to take all the transactions in the present or in the newest block, and we're going to wrap them up. We're going to hash this whole thing. So you just plug it into the hash function, and you're going to see what the output is. And then we're going to compare to this target. So for example, here is a successful hash, which turned out to be less than a target. Now, this idea of target, it's tricky to think of when we're looking at hexadecimal numbers, because we don't see them as numbers. But this here is a number, right? It's a very, it's a very big number, but not as big as it could be because of the leading zeros. So we saw last week a perfectly random output probably doesn't look like this. But then we did also mention that the likelihood of this particular hash coming up is the same as any other. It just so happens that represented as a number, this one is smaller than the target. Target is a number often rephrased as difficulty. So the difficulty as of July last year was 52 trillion. And that means it was that many times harder than one. One would be a difficulty level of one would be that every single time you're a winner. Every single hash meets the condition. Okay, A difficulty of two would mean that we'll move the target. So say you pick a random number between 0 and 99. Right. Everyone think of a random number between 0 and 99. If the target is 100, everybody wins. But that's a bit too easy, right? Because everybody's now winning and adding a lot of blocks. So to make it harder, we say, well, now the target is going to be reduced to 50. So now, again, you have to think of a random number, which is hard because you know the target's 50. Think of a random number between 0 and 100. And now only half of us are going to be less than 50. And we say, well, that's still a bit too easy. So we're going to reduce the target again. Okay? And the target level can come down to 1. We say, think of a number between 0 and 99. And there's only 1 out of 100 shot that you're going to be less than the target. So this is what miners are doing. They're taking their shots over and over and over. You do a hash. You make this comparison. Do another hash, make the comparison. And you're doing it a lot. And eventually, you're going to find one that comes out like this, really tiny, smallish, not right? The smallest number here is all zeros, right? So it's a smallish number compared to what it could be, less than the target. And then that is your winning condition. So there's this inverse relationship here between um, the difficulty level, which is 52 trillion, and the number you need to find, which is going to be much smaller. So Another way to think of it is you need, to, you need to run this operation 52 trillion times to have a probability of meeting the target. So back to my 0 to 99 example. If the target's 50 and you've got to get under 50, your random number, on average, you're going to have to do it twice. Right? First random number, might, I mean, it might be above or below. But on average, if you do it a lot, right? if you do it twice, one out of every two is going to meet the target. So here, on average, it's huge numbers. right? You have to do the hash 52 trillion times to meet the target. 
I mean, it's, it's exhausting, but it's OK. The, the miners are doing it for us. Um, so what exactly are they doing here? We have talked about SHA-256. It's got a random output, so you can't control it. You can't game it in any way. And you know, Satoshi, he picked SHA-256. It wasn't the other way around. The other way around might be that you're designing your own blockchain, and then you create a function right, that you say or suggest is fair play for everyone. So we already had SHA-256. We knew it was good, and it got imported to use. Um, it has to be quick to verify. So that means that if I give you a hash and you say, oh, no way you found it. Look at all those leading zeros. And I say, yeah, you can check. All you have to do is check it once. You just have to run one hash because I also give you the input to get that hash. So it's quick to verify. And it's impossible to reverse in a reasonable amount of time um, as a property of, of a hash function. So the, the processor that's doing this operation, the chips, um, these are just clock cycles, right? It's just how fast can your chip run this SHA-256 algorithm? So that's the limitation here. And I've got this highlighted. We'll come back to it next week. This is our scarce resource that's optimized in Bitcoin mining uh, that we're optimizing for is how many clock cycles can we get? So this is where the argument comes that Bitcoin is wasteful because people are optimizing to get more clock cycles into the network, right? So that's, you know, Instead of upgrading your phone every year, you're upgrading your phone as soon as you read about new hardware coming out of the different manufacturers, and you're chucking all your old stuff. Uh, you know, you have some business constraints in there as well, but you want as much as possible in hardware in order to meet this target and earn the block reward, which is where the Bitcoin comes from. Okay, so clock cycles to, to recap is our scarce resource. Next week, we'll talk about other scarce resources, for example, uh, memory, computer memory, um, and even things like humans and, and time. These are all scarce resources. So we've seen this evolution here. Um, even referencing back to that uh, video of the Chinese miners, there's been an evolution over those nine years of the mining equipment. The very first blocks were mined on CPUs. So, you know, Satoshi, you know, could have done it on his laptop or whatever CPU he was using. And you can just set it up to do your hash function uh, and set it up to repeat looking for the target. Eventually, though, as more and more people join the network, they migrated, they, they were looking for efficiency, right? Squeeze the system because I want to get more Bitcoin. So they started using FPGAs, which is an acronym for a field programmable gate array. And it's kind of like a DIY circuit board. So you can kind of like set up your own, you can kind of like set up your own chip architecture. And so people were doing this and they were designing their FPGAs only to do SHA-256 right here. Specifically just that, nothing else. Whereas a general purpose computer, right, it can do all sorts of different things. It has different, um, different inputs and outputs. It has different like uh, optimized areas for neural nets, for graphics, um, for it has specific parts for multiplication, right? Things like this. Now the next evolution was into GPUs. This all happened in about two or three or four years. And GPUs turned out that they could be optimized just to do SHA-256 and they were a little bit uh, more efficient. And they're also more common. So you could buy off-the-shelf GPUs, which used to just be for you know, gamers to run the highest resolution on their screen. Um, nowadays, GPUs are, you know, the, it's evolved you know, right past um, cryptocurrency mining. Nowadays, GPUs are used for AI, uh, and so for building models. Uh, the next evolution was the ASIC, the application-specific integrated circuit, which is which means you go to, you design your chip, you go to the chip fab, and you get them to build you chips that can only do SHA-256 because that's all you care about. And so they really are optimized at that point. And that's where we are right now, is with ASICs. So I have a Bitcoin miner. It's outdated, and so it's sort of, 
it's turning into like a museum piece. Um, the, the, the S9, the Antminer S9, used to be like the workhorse of the Bitcoin network. Don't know if I can get this in the stream. If you all don't want to be in the background, you got to let me know. Uh, okay. So I have here a old Bitcoin miner, which you can see in the picture there. Uh, it's got some specs on it. Pretty beefy piece of hardware. This is the power supply. So I'm going to spend a minute and just plug it in. Part of the time plugging it in is collect connecting the power supply to all the boards. So you can see there, 189 chips are in this box, right? 189 chips. In your phone, I think a modern iPhone has about eight chips in it, all right? Now, of course, they do different things, right? But uh, 189 chips in here. So that's all it is, is chips. And they're single purpose. They just run the SHA-256 function. So like four, five, six years ago, these units were the workhorses of the Bitcoin network. They're outdated now. They're slow compared to the new units. A couple years back in New Zealand, it was really hard to get miners. And this was going for like $1,000 on trade me now it's probably i don't know what it's worth now uh, because it can't keep up you pay more in electricity than you're going to get out of it in bitcoin uh, so it's more of like a hobby unit these days it's got no on off switch you just plug it in and it goes so it's going to cycle and you'll know it when it when it comes up Uh, a modern miner, I can maybe look it up, is probably about 10,000. So an Ant Miner S19 Pro is 110 terahashes. Uh, so there's an idea of some of the pricing of these things. So 5K for a new unit, 151 terahashes. All right, so it doesn't take long to heat up. And of course, they're very noisy. So you don't want to live with one too closely. Uh, so you asked what happens if you're running a miner and you get, you get the reward? Yeah, so when you, when you set, up, set it up, right, you have to have an account to be able to collect. So you got to put in your address. Uh, and also, uh, you could you could plug this in and run it solo, but the probability that you would ever earn any return is astronomically low. And so what you wanna do is connect your unit to a pool of other people that share the rewards. Uh, and so mining pools and the dynamics of that are like a whole other sub-branch of cryptocurrencies that we are not going to get into in a whole lot of detail. The limit really is electricity. It costs over $5 a day to run. When I looked up the numbers for this, uh, not profitable in a number of years, unless I can find cheaper electricity than 19 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and so as a business input to the network, this is what Bitcoiners and cryptocurrency miners are doing. They're looking for cheap electricity. They're traveling all around the world and they're looking for areas that have cheap electricity or even like stranded electricity that isn't being used. So if you're a power generating station, you might not be able to sell all the electricity that you make. You might not have enough customers to take it. And so now Bitcoin miners are setting up shop in these specific places so that they can take some of this excess load from power companies. And um, it's really quite a, quite a unique part about Bitcoin mining that is tied into the energy grid system uh, because you need electricity as your input to get the clock cycles running. And uh, perhaps we can talk more about this at a, later, at a later time, the idea of electricity usage in Bitcoin mining.
Uh, so we did see the clip. So what it's like working in a Bitcoin mine. One of my favorite lines is right at the beginning. And the guy in the car says, like, uh, life mining Bitcoin is pretty dull. Uh, and that's because, you know, as you saw, there's only a few people that can run a whole data center. And there's not much going on, right? There's, there's no cafes, you know, there's, there's no bus stops, right? Uh, it's just a warehouse with computers. And your job is to keep the computers running. And so I think it is still like that, as was mentioned. I think it is still uh, a little bit dull. Um, you know, if you're like a technician, they also need to hire people to come in and repair the miners. So replace the power supplies, do these types of things. Um, you know, the uh, just because you're leaving money on the table if you don't have people come in and um, looking at the boards, cleaning them out, and doing the repairs, things like this. Uh, so Mongolia, right? Mongolia, I don't know much about Mongolia, but I don't think it's very warm. And so this is another um, advantage if you have a cold climate and you have power generation, it's like a perfect match for a data center, right? Not even just Bitcoin, right? Um, go to like Iceland and Scandinavia, where you've got free air conditioning, for your data center, uh, that can cut down on your energy cost. Um, conversely, opening a mine in the desert, I don't know how practical that is. The thermodynamics are working against you, though. OK, so this chart is updated. I did this one today. And this is a picture of the whole network. So by the time we add up all the nodes, we get one picture, right? Like how many people are participating? But there's a, a, another way to view it is looking at things like the target difficulty level and working out how many computer chips are running in the network. So this is called hash rate. And you know, going back in time, it looked like there was almost none in 2017. But if you were to zoom in, you would, you would see a different story. And it definitely looks, there's a big dip here. It definitely looks you know, bordering on exponential growth in hash rate. And the other thing is that like, any time in the past five years, you're pretty much always at an all-time high if you were to look at this chart. So you know, it looks like this is like the max that the Bitcoin network has ever seen, which is 600 exa hashes. So that's 10 to the 18, right? So enormously large numbers. Um, uh, this graph here is a proxy for network security because all of these miners and all of these people that make the hardware, that sell the hardware, that repair the hardware, um, all of the people that are relying on their transactions in the network to go through and be reliable, everyone is behind this graph, meaning that there essentially are almost no players that want the network to fail. Everybody kind of wants the network to succeed, be a good network, do what it's designed to do. Uh, and then the growth here can be attributed to the fact that um, to the fact that you can sell your Bitcoin for money. And so you can make a profitable business doing this. And so um, I mean, a lot of interesting dynamics in the Bitcoin network. And this is one way to look at it. Um, another way to look at it would be to say, like, well, if I want to subvert the network, how much hash rate do I need to sort of take control? Um, maybe I don't have enough, but you can play out the game theory, right? What large entities, what large companies or states or countries could join forces or on their own, you know, acquire Bitcoin miners in secret, start adding them to the network. And then if you get enough, perhaps you could tip over Byzantine fault tolerant consensus uh, and start to direct consensus. And so if we look at the graph, and we need more than half in order to mine the longest chain, we had Jeff versus Bob before. Well, then you would need another 650 exahashes on top of this in order to have half the network power. And that's in a static sense. That's if you could do it over overnight, um, when in reality, it's dynamic. and so. So, some under, other interesting game theory trends here where you think about, well, could you know, the United States government or could the Chinese government right, 
the big rich ones, could they mine Bitcoin kind of like uh, uh, kind of like in secret? Could they start buying Bitcoin mining equipment so that they can start to take over the network? And it's like they could start to, sure. Anybody can start to. Um, but in order to gain enough advantage, you know, it would take a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of hardware. And, and oh, by the way, people would know about it. People would see it coming. Um, so yeah, a lot of interesting things that could be said here about Bitcoin mining and hash rate. Uh, we have a unique event. I should get the live shot up here. This is, let's go here. Okay, so there's another unique event in Bitcoin mining that's coming up, and it's gonna happen during our time together here. So in 37 days, we are expecting the Bitcoin halving to happen. It happens here at block height 840,000, and it's a, like a pre-programmed event into the software. It's, it's not that somebody decided, let's have a party. Uh, um, it, it's been there since the very beginning. It's happened three times before, so this will be the fourth time that it happens, and the result of the halving is that that block reward where people can earn Bitcoins, uh, it gets cut in half. Uh, we see here uh, network difficulty. So my trillion was out of date. It's, you know, network difficulty is up to almost 84 trillion, for those of you keeping track. I mean, really, it wasn't that long ago If I made this number in July, right, <clears throat> it was 52 trillion, and now it's 84 trillion, like that is tremendous growth for a computing network. Okay, so uniquely Bitcoin having, right now there's six and a quarter Bitcoins every 10 minutes that are, that are released, and if Bitcoin today is, in round numbers, is 100,000 New Zealand dollars, so every 10 minutes there's 600,000 New Zealand dollars coming onto the market of Bitcoin. Seems like a lot. But it's a global market. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not just uniquely to one one region. So that's going to get cut in half, fifty percent. So there will be three and an eighth after the halving. So the next block here, eight hundred forty thousand and one, will be reduced to that. Um, this is an important part about these open source distributed systems. Is that the rules are written into the code and you can't just change the rules according to what you want. You can't just change, you can't, you can't even just like hire someone to change the rules, right? You can't form a committee to get them to change the rules. There are ways to change them, but essentially this idea that code is law means that the rules are baked in and if you don't want to play by the rules, that's fine. You can use another system, you know? No, nobody's forcing you to do this. So we have this thing here, the Coinbase transaction output. This is where the, the company name Coinbase got their name from this in the Bitcoin code, the Coinbase transaction. So in every single block, there's a Coinbase transaction which will award, which will award the winner fees. which will award the winner fees plus this block subsidy. So you also earn fees for processing transactions as a miner. Um, so here's the method, get block subsidy. Anybody can go look at it on GitHub. And it says that there's going to be 64 halvings. After that, there's no block subsidy. 64 is a lot, we're on number four. The network is actually designed to run until 2140. So another 117 years, 116 years. Um, the first block reward was 50, and it's been cut in half every time. So 50, 25, 12 and a half, six and a quarter is where we're at. And you know, there it is, it's in code. And in the early days of cryptocurrency, when people were forking the code and altering it for their own purposes, they were like messing around with this stuff, change the block reward, change the block time, change the block size. We'll do all sorts of sort of tweaking of parameters. Um, and of course, so you could too, if you want to change this, you could too, right? But the difficult part is this social consensus that everyone's going to agree to your network. Okay, back to this 
graph. We've seen the difficulty level. I just gave us the updated figure. Um, you know, went from like 50 to 90 trillion was the, the difficulty level. So that means it's getting harder to find a hash. And so, for example, using your own computer, or even using your own single miner, you know, it's unlikely you're going to earn a block reward on your own. But people are still doing it because they can join a group, a conglomerate called a mining pool. And they can get sort of revenue streamed in um, regular amounts by contributing to a pool. And so this is how most of the business of mining works these days. If you're running a mining operation, rather than waiting to find your own block reward, you're probably pointing your hash rate at a pool, you're joining forces, and then the pool has a payout structure such that everyone gets you know, equal payouts minus a fee for the pool operator. So that's kind of how the, the mining has evolved. And it's not necessarily something that was thought to have been in a, that Satoshi wanted to happen in the beginning. Um, but, but that's also one of the criticisms in Bitcoin is that the mining pools are now a bit centralized. And you know what happens if all the miners, there's a lot in Texas right now, what happens if all the miners end up in Texas? And then like suddenly Texas has this like geographical fence around all the Bitcoin miners that they can you know, perhaps start to apply some pressure to using regulation and laws and things like that. Um, and we don't know if that, if it will ever come to that, but we do know that we've seen countries outright ban mining. We've seen countries outright reverse the ruling on banning mining. This dip here, it looks like it's a COVID dip. And if I run the scale back, March of 2020 was COVID. So you can see a little dip here. So there's a lot of uncertainty when COVID first hit and that produced a crash in the price in the cryptocurrency markets, well, all markets. And uh, so there was a tiny dip in COVID, but zooming out and looking at the graph as a whole, you can't really see a COVID dip like you can in other graphs. So if you think about anything to do with finance, stocks, anything to do with like s supply chain, commodities, inventories, um, even things like people applying for jobs. If you look at all these charts, there's always a COVID blip. Uh, there's a dip when COVID happened. So Bitcoin mining doesn't seem to have really cared that there was a pandemic. But it did care that something happened here in uh, June of 2021. And that something was China banning Bitcoin mining. So China stepped in and said, no, we, we don't care for these miners. Um, and we're just going to you know, make a snap decision. And so the miners, over the next you know, number of weeks, had to unplug all their miners and arrange for them to be shipped somewhere else that they were allowed to continue their business. So the, you know, the miners don't just like go on to the next thing, right? These are people that have invested their money, they're running businesses, you know, they have employees, right? Uh, and also, oh, by the way, they're also Bitcoiners. So they're also probably aligned in some way with this idea of an alternative financial system. And so rather than the miners just disappearing, and you could imagine that people would have thought this graph was crashing to zero and be like, oh, the network is dying. China banned mining. What are they going to do? You know, it's too expensive to mine in these other places. Um, but not so. So the miners packed up and left and moved other places uh, and then just started all over again. You know, plug it in, join a mining pool, create your own, whatever it is. And so there was a dip here about seven or eight months before we were back to previous highs, and then since then, you know, it's been nothing but nothing but up. So, something that keeps this in check um, is called the difficulty adjustment. And so, over time, if it looks like more people are joining, we're going to make it harder. So, I mentioned about the zero to ninety-nine target difficulty. So, if too many people are guessing the right number, we're going to change. We're going to move the goalpost and change the difficulty level, and that's what happens every two weeks. There's what's called a difficulty adjustment in the network. And it can adjust up and down. If people are finding blocks too fast, uh, 
that mean that indicates that more hash rate has come into the network, the difficulty will adjust up to make it harder. And that will then slow the block time down. If the block time is way too slow, like every, it's supposed to be 10 minutes. If the block time gets way too slow, like every 12 or 13 or 14 minutes on average, then the difficulty will adjust down so that the block time will come down. When the difficulty goes down, it gets easier for miners to find blocks. So there's this like dance between block time in the network and the difficulty level in the network. And then uh, the difficulty level itself, that adjustment has been programmed in from the beginning. So that's not a surprise to anyone. Uh, it's been there, again, if you lay out the rules at the beginning and you don't change them, people generally will play fair. They'll be like, oh, I see this system, if I like it, or maybe I'll try it out first, see if I like it, and if I don't, I can leave. If I do, I'll stay in it. You know, compare with modern finance, where there's often very few alternatives for people to choose from. So you might get locked into a system, and if you don't like it, really, you're stuck. Uh, so I just wanted to say about the, the blip that's not COVID in this graph, which is incredible, and the difficulty adjustment. Also, next week, we're going to look at a little bit more at scarcity. So Bitcoin mining network, as we know it right now, is using clock cycles as the scarce resource to occupy. So we say scarce resource, but of course, you can make more chips and put it into the network. And we've seen this happen. That's the growth in hash rate that we saw. But still at a, you know, at the chip level, it's how fast can our processor perform these operations of the SHA-256. Uh, we'll also look into the definition of a blockchain. So can we like, can we write something down, you know, as that is representative of a system that we now call a blockchain.